Okay, well, are we recording? Yes. Let's begin with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise, first of all, for letting us back in the church. And um, we uh, take this as a good sign that you are going to be victorious over this pandemic that uh, ravages the earth right now. We ask for your blessing and uh, your understanding and your spirit as we continue to study uh, the Bible. Tonight, we are going to be studying other th things, but it will help us understand the Bible even better. So we ask your help through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So... Tonight, we're going to talk about two important New Testament theories. Now, it's uh, kind of, I'll get into that in just a minute. So two important New Testament theories. So get your favorite beverage. I don't know how long tonight's lesson is going to be. It all kind of depends on the questions that you have. And I have a feeling that you're going to have a lot of questions because what I'm going to teach you is not in the Bible per se. It is stuff that New Testament scholars have picked this detail and matched it up with that detail and put these parts together and we can figure out what some people were thinking at the time of Jesus, but we don't, it's never ever in any document that we found out written this way. So I'm going to give it to you so it's actually going to help you understand the things that you're going to read. So make sure that you do have your Bible, because we will be using it at one point, and uh, a pen, and um, anything else that you need. Okay, so the very first thing that we're going to talk about is what people in the first century thought was going to happen at the end of the world. And this is very important, because um, we know that for... Jews, like the Sadducees, did not believe in resurrection. And for many years, up until the Babylonian exile, the Jewish people just believed that you went to sleep and that was it. You went down into the dirt when you were buried and that your existence was over. And it was somewhere between the Babylonian exile and... Um, the occupation by the Greeks, that there came to be this prophetic development that told the people that there would be a resurrection from the dead. And so we can see in um, the book of Job, for example, when Job says, I know I, my Redeemer lives and I shall stand with him on the last day. So it's there. The first and second book of books of the Maccabees talk about resurrection from the dead. Actually um, saying those words, resurrection from the dead. And the book of Daniel talks about resurrection too. So it does appear in the Old Testament. We have kind of shades of it appearing in the Psalms, but never really spelled out. And so we need to find out what people were thinking about this resurrection, because we've seen in the Gospels that um, the Pharisees and the Essenes did believe in a resurrection from the dead. So we need to figure out what kind of resurrection they believed in and how this would happen and what led up to it and how it would be. So the first thing that you need to know is that in the Old Testament, there is some this thing called the Day of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And that's, um, they say Lord instead of Yahweh. And the day of the Lord would come, and for some it would be great and terrible, something awful. 
something that they would dread, something that would make them shake in their bones. And for other people who are virtuous, the day of the Lord would be something wonderful, something vindicating, something rewarding, something very good for them. But it depended on not so much how you acted, although that came through in the prophets too, was depending on how you believed and what your relationship to the Lord was. So um, we see uh, that this day of the Lord is something that's going to come upon people suddenly. They don't know when it's going to come. And when the day of the Lord comes, it will be decisive. There will be no gray area. It will be black or white where you stand in relationship to the Lord. So um, the day of the Lord was generally something to be feared. Now, we have something that scholars... Oh, let's go back to this again. Scholars... Oh, have figured out what uh, many Jews, the Pharisees and the Essenes believed in the first century. That was the time when Jesus lived. And it's a theory. First of all, you should know this. It's a reconstruction of different ideas. So this is so, and what I mean by that is that if I were to go back in time in a time machine and find a Pharisee that lived in the first century and describe to him what I'm about to tell you, that Pharisee would scratch his head and say, I don't know what you're talking about. But when I would tell him how I understood what he believed, he would say, oh yes, that's what I believe. So he just wouldn't understand this tool that I'm giving you. He wouldn't understand how I would have come about getting it. But many uh, scholars have combed through the Bible and found different parts and put them together. And we've also combed through extra biblical literature. That is um, like the uh, testimony of Enoch, the testimony of the 12 tribes, um, the apocalypse of Moses, there are all these different books that were around that we know were around because we found them in the Dead Sea Scrolls and we know that they were around at the time of Jesus and we know that people were reading them. And so we figured out that Jesus was probably reading them too. So there are these many parts that add up to what I'm about to tell you. And what I'm about to tell you is called the apocalyptic worldview. So please write that down. This is very important. The apocalyptic worldview. We are going to be coming back to this theory again and again and again, all through the Acts of the Apostles and through the letters of Paul, and even in the book of Revelation, if we get lucky enough to make it that far. But if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand what Paul thought about the resurrection uh, or you're not even going to understand what Jesus thought about the resurrection. You're, you're going to be kind of moving around in this touchy-feely world, and you're not going to be able to put your thoughts in a straight line. So the apocalyptic worldview has four points. The first point is that the world was created good. Creation is good. And we know that from the book of Genesis, don't we? God looked at everything he had made, and he said, it is very good. So creation is good. The world is created good. The corollary of this is what is old is better. So new things are to be distrusted. Older things are to be trusted. The second point is the world is deteriorating because of sin. You don't need to be a theologian to understand this. All you need to do is turn on the news, right? So the world is deteriorating because of sin. As time goes on, the world gets to be a worse and worse place. It's deteriorating because of sin. Now, how do we solve this? 
Well, we of ourselves cannot. The only way that we can solve this is only a decisive divine intervention into history is the cure. So let's take that apart. Only, so this is the only cure, decisive, it must be active, divine, it has to come from God, intervention into history. So this cannot be something that happens on the spiritual plane only. It has to be something that comes into uh, time and space where we live into history. And it is the cure. Who knows what it is? But that is what the, they were talking about in the Old Testament when they talked about the day of the Lord. And then when that decisive divine intervention happens, the general resurrection will happen. Now, when I say general resurrection, people get confused. They think I'm talking about Jesus' resurrection. No, general resurrection means we all, everybody in the world throughout time rises from their graves. So the general resurrection means all of us. The general resurrection and then judgment and life with God. So these are the four points of the apocalyptic worldview. And I hope you write them down in a very special place because you're going to be coming back to them again and again. The world was created good. The world is deteriorating because of sin. Only a decisive divine intervention into history is the cure. And following that, there will be the general resurrection, judgment, and life with God. So, I am going to do something that I've never done before, and I hope it works. I am going to draw this for you. So, this is the apocalyptic worldview. This is, whoops, let's get down here. This is creation right here. That spot. And then there's a timeline, which is called the old age. Which means that as time goes on, this is a timeline, right? So this is the past. This is the future. This is where we live along this timeline somewhere. And as life goes on, it becomes worse and worse in the world because of sin. Now, there's going to be a divine intervention into history right through that timeline. Because of that divine intervention into history, there is going to be resurrection, judgment, and life with God. And that is called the new age. So, this age, this new age, never ends. It keeps going. The old age stopped right there at the divine intervention. So we don't know what that divine intervention is at this point in the first century or leading up to Jesus. We don't know what it is. So here I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to take questions to see if anyone uh, uh, is confused as to what this means. So Debbie, are there any questions? Not yet. Okay, I'll give you guys about a minute to ask a question if you have a question yet. Okay, well, I'll go on. If the question comes up, then um, please uh, just, uh, uh, oh, from Suzanne. I'm sorry, it's Suzanne, I see it. Does that mean that humanity will go on forever? Yes, okay, so 
we were originally created, Adam and Eve were created to be eternal beings. And so what happens is that after we are resurrected from the dead, we will live forever with God. So yes, that is true. Okay, Elizabeth McGee had a question. I take it as Jesus, the divine intervention. Elizabeth, you're a step ahead of me. You just wait. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so so nobody knew what the divine intervention was. Let me see where my Bible study is. Oh, that's not it. This is it. Okay. So now we come to the place where Paul sees what has happened when he meets the risen Christ. And Paul sees that God has acted deci decisively and that the general resurrection has begun in the person of Jesus. In fact, we can talk, we can put these two points together, the decisive action and the general resurrection they are not two separate parts, but they are one point, and they should be the third point. This is what Paul is thinking in his mind. But there's a problem. There's still sin in the world. And you don't need to be a theologian to, to see this, right? You can see that there's still sin in the world. John Agramon, what about the second coming of Jesus? Will that be the new timeline? Okay, you guys are way in front of me. Just hang on a minute. I'm getting there. You guys are too smart. Gosh, not even my college kids could do this. Okay, you should feel proud of yourself. Okay, so this is what I'm going to show you. We're going to draw again how Paul interpreted, reinterpreted, the apocalyptic worldview. So, come back here. Come on, you can do it. And here's creation. This is the start of the Page. This is not easy to do with the mouse, by the way. So here goes the old age, right along. So, so far, so good. This is what the, the all the other Jews, well, not all the, the Sadducees didn't believe this, but this is what all the other Pharisees and Essenes believed at the time of Paul, that the old age was deteriorating as time went on. Then, comes the decisive intervention by God. And for Paul, this decisive intervention is the resurrection. I'll just put a big R for resurrection. So for Paul, he's thinking just like all the other Jews, well, there should be a new age now, right? And indeed, there is a new age because, because we have the gift of the spirit so that we are living in a new way. Those who um, are gifted with the spirit live with this in this new age. However, unfortunately, sin is still continuing. So we have this old age going on. What is happening? So for Paul, we live right here. Between the old age and the new age. With one foot in each. So. Does that answer your question, Elizabeth McGee? Yes, good. Okay. So I'm going to 
I'm going to get to John's um, uh, question in just a minute. So, the time we live in is called the last days. And in fact, the Mormons got this right when they named their church. All of us who are baptized are saints of the last days. We are Latter-day Saints. Unfortunately, they got a lot of their theology wrong, so we don't follow them. But they did get the name right. So if you do have your Bible, I want you to turn to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. In my Bible, that's page 1780. And in your Bible, I want you to turn to chapter 2, verse 17. This is a very important speech that Peter gives after they have just received the Holy Spirit, and they are talking to all the strangers in Jerusalem who are there for that festival. And what he says in verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17, it will come to pass in the last days, says the prophet Joel. God says that I will pour out a portion of my spirit upon all flesh. Well, there it is. Peter realizes that what Joel had prophesied has come to pass, that these are the last days now, and that God is sharing his spirit with everybody. Now, here comes the part that you were asking about. So what is the last days running up to? We are awaiting the return of the Lord. And that return of the Lord is called the parousia. It's a Greek name, Greek word. It means the visit of a king. Parousia. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to the First Thessalonians chapter 4. In my Bible, it's on page 1961. It's one of the last of Paul's letters. First Thessalonians. There's two letters to the Thessalonians. Make sure you get the first one. Chapter 4, verse 13. This is a reading that we often have at funerals because it is so hopeful. But in it, Paul is going to describe the parousia for you. Verse 13, chapter 4, verse 13, he says, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep, so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Okay, a little bit of context for this letter. People in Thessalonica were writing Paul and saying, I'm so sad because grandma died before Jesus came back. What's going to happen? Did she miss out? So Paul's writing and saying, don't worry about grandma. God's got grandma taken care of. So this is what he's writing about. He says, we do not want you to grieve without hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose, so will God through Jesus bring with him all those who have fallen asleep like grandma. Indeed, we tell you this on the word of the Lord. So he has received this as a prophetic utterance that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. So guess what? Grandma's going to get to see Jesus before you do. For the Lord himself, with a word of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God will come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Okay, remember the general resurrection we were talking about. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore console one another with these words. Okay, so something that I need to tell you is that a parousia in the Greek term meant that the king was going to come visit your city, your castle. And you don't wait until the king arrives at your castle and knocks at the gate, the drawbridge. That's rude. What you do is you have your soldiers stationed around on the walls and they're looking for the flags of the king, the banners. And when they see it far off, they run and tell you and you send a delegation. So your delegation goes out to the king before he even gets to your city and welcomes him. And then together they all come back in. And when the king comes to your city, he takes possession of it. He claims it as his own. Okay, so let's interpret this in Christian terms. When Jesus returns, Paul is saying, he's going to come back from heaven somehow. And he is going to need a delegation. We don't just wait for him to show up on earth and say, oh, hi, Jesus, I didn't know you were here. All those who had been asleep will rise at his voice and come to greet him in the air and bring him back down. And then we all will realize that Jesus has taken possession of the earth and we will all live with him and he will truly be king. That is what parousia means. So the early Christians took that Greek word and they gave it a Christian meaning, the return of the king. And the return of the king is Jesus coming back. And we know that Jesus is coming back because he has told us so in at least three gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles. So let's go back to this diagram. Let's see if we can erase some stuff and do it over again. Oops, that's not erasing. Here we have an eraser. There, okay. Let's erase this. Let's erase this. Let's erase that. Okay. So this is fun. You guys should do it. Okay, so here, this is how Paul reinterprets the apocalyptic worldview. Here's creation, right? Here's the old age going along, getting worse as sin continues. And then here's the divine intervention right into history, just slices right through it. And that is, my friends, the resurrection. But it's not as if Jesus is the only one who re will resurrect, because Paul sees this not as something, what's the word that I'm looking at for? In Great Britain, they call it a one-off. Um, it's not something idiosyncratic, or it's not something that will never happen again. It is something that starts something else. This is just the beginning of the general resurrection. And we know that the general resurrection has already started because one person has risen from the dead and that's Jesus. So when he rises from the dead, the new age starts and it will go on forever. That's right, new age here. Okay, so 
This was Paul's problem, remember? He saw that sin did not stop. Sin is still going. And we live here in the last days. Between the new age and the old age with a foot in each. And actually, some of that is actually our own problem, right? Because even though we have the spirit, we are sinners too. So we're living in this temporary period here. And then you know what's going to happen? Let's see. How can we make this a different color? Here. Right here. Bam. The old age is going to stop right at that point. And this is, my friends, the parousia. So when Jesus comes, sinning stops. No one can sin anymore. And everyone right here, when Jesus comes, rises from their grave. And the only thing that is left is the new age where we will be. So this is how Paul has reinterpreted the apocalyptic worldview. He took those four points and he combined general resurrection and divine intervention. And he said, Jesus's resurrection was the beginning of the general, Jesus' resurrection was the beginning of the general resurrection. And we are living in the time until Jesus returns when there will be judgment and life together forever with, with the Lord. Okay, now, now let's see if you have any questions. Bill looks like he's enjoying this. Are you enjoying this, Bill? We do have one question, Father Brent. Okay. Since Paul is saying that those who went ahead of us will be in heaven before us, are we to believe that what he wrote in his letters was divinely inspired? Okay, so two things. Paul doesn't talk about heaven. We are not talking about heaven. We are talking about life on earth. You see, for all the Old Testament, the yearning was not to get to heaven. That's been something that developed in the Middle Ages for people who needed some hope. People were talking about a return to Eden, which meant life on earth together with God, which was God's original plan, wasn't it? to live with Adam and Eve and eat them forever. And so if we can get back to Eden, which is life on earth, that would be a fulfillment of God's plan. So Paul's not talking about heaven. He says we will, the, those people will rise up into the air to greet Jesus, to bring him back down to the earth, and then we will all live with the Lord forever. But he means here on earth, we will have unending life here on earth. What was the second part of that? Was he spiritually inspired? Was he, do, are we to believe that what he wrote in his letters was divinely inspired? Oh, yes. Well, we believe that anyway. It didn't have to, it, that didn't depend on um, uh, anything heavenly or not. That depended on him being uh, an apostle and um, and uh, being prophetic in his writing. We believe that all scriptures is inspired. We covered that in, in the very beginning of, of Bible study. So uh, it's all scripture is uh, a, a combined effort on the divine part and the human part intersecting so that God can speak to us in words and culture and time that we can understand. Yes. 
Okay, any other questions? Yes. Suzanne, Emma and I are debating and a bit confused. Are people with God now? Well, okay, so what do you think the spirit is, Emma? We call the spirit the third person of the Trinity, don't we? That's God. We are with God now, somehow. But we are not completely with God. Jesus has not returned. And so, when Jesus returns, then we will be completely with God. I hope that helps. Well, either everybody is so confused and so embarrassed that they don't want to ask any questions at all, or you are the smartest class I have ever had in my life. Okay. Suzanne, what about the people who have died, like saints? Yes. Okay. So Paul didn't know about heaven, right? Like I said, heaven was something that we came to that was, de <laughs> was a theology that was developed in the Middle Ages. So we didn't even talk about saints before that. We talked about people awaiting the return of Jesus. If we are on earth, what about verses 17 in 1 Thessalonians? Verse 17, thus we shall always be in the Lord, with them to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, we can go up to the air, but we come back down. That was never in doubt in Paul's mind. We can be part of that delegation too. Okay, and there's another question here. Okay. And it says, does this interpretation affect our belief in our funerals and care of the body? It should. Let me tell you, it should. Because I think a lot of people do not respect the body enough, especially after death. And this is one of the reasons why the church prefers, but does not demand, that you have a casket at your funeral. And it's mainly because of catechetical reasons. They think that if you and your children see a box of ashes, you do not understand the resurrection from the dead, the general resurrection from the dead, well enough. However, the church also realizes that it's a lot cheaper for some people and that um, there isn't, in some cities, they don't have places to bury people. So they make concessions on this. They also know that God can raise anyone from the dead, whether they were buried at sea and eaten up by sharks or mauled by bears in the mountains or, um, or their bodies were cremated. God can do anything. So that's not the problem. The thing that the church wants to do, though, is that it wants to show its children, who are us, that we care for the body because we believe that this body has a future. Now, Paul talks a lot about, in some of his writings, uh, especially in Romans, about um, how there is going to be a spiritual body. And the thing is that when we rise from the dead, and we actually say this in the Eucharistic prayer number three at funerals, that when our um, earthly body is destroyed, a heavenly body awaits us. But we also say that when Christ comes again, he will call us forth from the grave. And we will find that our bodies are transformed into the pattern of his glorious body. 
So while we don't really know what we are going to look like or how we are going to exist in the resurrected life, we can look at Jesus and know that it will be whatever he was. So in the Gospel of John, remember, he was walking through locked doors. In the Gospel of Luke, he was eating food with people. So there is something um, still bodily about that. And yet there is something spiritual about it, too. It is a glorious body. Okay, Elaine Garman, why isn't this topic covered more frequently in our faith? Because people won't understand it. I was trying to teach it to college kids, and they didn't get it. I went to Catholic school, K through 12, and I've never really encountered this before. Well, okay, so Elaine, to make you feel a little better, let me tell you this. I am one of the scripture scholars who came up with this theory. So, okay, so maybe it wasn't around when you were going to school. So, um, so but this is, um, I think this actually helps us understand resurrection better. And I think that if you have these tools in your back pocket, and we will be coming back to these again and again to talk about them and to remind you of them, then it will help you interpret what Paul is writing about. Because Paul has these ideas in his head. He didn't list them out as the apocalyptic world theory and how I reinvented the apocalyptic world theory. But he has these notions in his head and he's writing according to them. And unless we know what those notions are, we're not gonna understand what he says. That's why so much of what Paul writes to us sounds the same over and over again. When we read Paul, we think, wow, this is really opaque. I don't understand what he means. And he's repeating himself a lot. But with these tools, we will be able to read Paul dissect what he's saying and see that he is actually making a point that pertains to our lives. And I think that will make us better Christians. What happens to us between death and the resurrection? Thomas, very good question. If you want to know the answer to that, you look in the catechism. Catechism says that your spiritual body is held in heaven for you until the general resurrection. So before Jesus returns, what exactly do we believe happens to the saints? Where are they? Heaven? Yes. What exactly is heaven? Trying to contemplate all of this from Jose. Okay. Jose, so yes, there is a heaven. And I've just said, um, uh, when you die... Uh, if you go to God, then you are in heaven with God in some sort of spiritual body. Who knows what that looks like? But, and you are beholding the face of God. We do know that. But we also know that you are awaiting Christ's return to earth when all will be all in Christ. That's what we know. And don't think that you're just going to get this in 20 minutes. I mean, I studied for a long time before I could get I could grasp this. So if it's taking you a while to wrap your mind around it, that's okay. That's why we're going to keep coming back to it again and again. Father Brent, there is one other question from earlier that's an extension of the question about care of the body. And it says, what about organ donations? Uh, what about organ donations? Well, I think that organ donations fall under that mystery that is um, at once charity. I mean, it is charitable to give your organs to somebody. Does that mean that God is going to reclaim that organ for you at your death? Um, I don't think that it works quite that way. I mean, you can also act ask about amputated limbs, right? I mean, I think that what we are trying to put as obstacles to God's power are really very silly things all in all. I think that God has much more power to work his will and his glory than we give God credit for. 
Okay, Elizabeth McGee, is the new heaven and new earth in Revelations 21, verse 1, the world without sin once Jesus returns? Yes. Yes, you've got it. Yes, the new heaven and new earth is the world. Yeah, yes. And it's also the new Jerusalem where everyone will live without a tear, without crying. And we will have the mark of our savior on our brow to show who we belong to. That is all uh, symbolic language though. You need to know that all of um, all of Revelation was written in code because it was uh, it was um, anti-governmental uh, writing, and so they were afraid they were going to be caught, and so they put everything in special code so that if you were a Christian, you understood what they were writing about, but if you were a Roman, you'd get this book of dreams and visions and animals and beasts and angels and you would think I don't even know what these people are talking about so but yes new heaven and the new earth is the new age yes that's right what about purgatory Jose we're not talking about purgatory purgatory didn't come around until the middle ages when nobody knew what to do about it I believe in purgatory because I believe in a God of second chances and a God of third chances and a God of fourth chances and a God of fifth chances. I believe that God is going to give us as many chances as we need to behold the face of God and be happy with him. There you have it. I don't think Paul even would even start to think about purgatory. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means that it was never in Paul's mind. Okay, so friends, that will bring it to an end for tonight. Next week, uh, this week, I will be sending out, um, last year I did a little, um, uh, PowerPoint presentation on the Ascension for Cath uh, Cathedral Catholic High School. I'll be sending that out again because that's our scripture for this weekend. And uh, it'll, it's just 15 minutes. I mean, you can just watch it and uh, get some spiritual benefit out of it. And then next week, we will be talking about Pentecost because that's the week after. I don't want to get into uh, Acts of the Apostles before Memorial Day, because my vacation starts and it'll be June, and I know that whatever I teach you now, I'll have to reteach you again, and I don't want to, I don't want to do that. So, um, so we will start Acts of the Apostles in July. So uh, your only um, uh, your only homework is to read the first two chapters of the Acts of the Apostles for um, Monday. And that, that will just be Pentecost. We'll just talk about Pentecost then. Okay, so until next week, stay healthy, stay well, stay holy, and keep reading your Bibles. God bless you. Bye.